If you have been to Rents.com today, I hope you have. And if you haven't, please do stop by and go to the top of the homepage. Look at the number one story up there with the pictures. And I would like you to pay attention to it. The article in second position up there is by Yoichi Shimatsu. It is one of the most elegant, historically illuminating, fully accurate articles I've ever seen. It's a really an analysis of, of history. It's entitled, Amelia Earhart's Free Spirit Soars Above a Sordid World. And it's a beautiful title. It's a, it's a great piece. You've got to read it. And then above that, you'll find the, the tip-off that uh, Yoshi gave me about where the Lockheed Electra really was. It wasn't over on the right side. And if you want to see where it really was that day, go click on the top the top link and you'll find it. Yoshi, welcome back and thanks for such a, a, an extraordinary article that you've written. Well, I think, uh, you know, we both did what we could uh, based on what we know your team and yourself did excellent on the photo analysis. And uh, we have to give, you know, the full credit for the History Channel to finally break the biggest open secret about World War II, you know? The, the, absolutely. Uh, yeah, of, absolutely. Uh, and, and again, she wasn't murdered as a spy. I, I, forgot, I should have emphasized that a little more in the article until after the outbreak of the war. You see, before then, she was held prisoner because they didn't. Uh, the Japanese captors didn't know what to do with her because it'd be illegal to execute her as a spy. You know, when Japan at the time was still an ally, you know, when she was captured, was an ally, as I point out, of, of, of both Britain and the USA mm-hmm. under the, and, and admittedly, you know, the alliance was pretty much tattered by the events in China and Manchuria and all that. But the Washington, you know, uh, naval accords, which were based on London naval agreement, uh, had, had not really expired in any way. So, you know, technically Japan was still sort of beholden to report to London and uh, Washington and wasn't supposed to act like that, you know, treat American citizens as some sort of heinous enemies, you know, because there was uh, no war at the time and there was a nominal alliance at least, you know, and diplomatic contacts all right, right. gamut. So right. this was a terrible deed that they did, you know, it was a real violation, you know, of uh, of uh, an alliance, you know, so this was... Yeah. Um, so you're a saying cr- it, was one of, it was a high crime, and, and the greater I think problem was the FDR, you know Franklin Delano Roosevelt, right. and his wife Eleanor, who was a good friend. Eleanor was a patroness of Amelia Earhart, wanted to learn flying from her. Okay, so this was a personal betrayal, along with as a political act of you know absolute cowardice. Yeah. That was exactly the word that popped into my mind when you said it. It's total cowardice. Uh, And then three and a half years later, (laughs) Pearl Harbor, FDR, handwriting all over it. No no arguing about it anymore. No, I accepted it long ago. The the man was just the worst. He was surrounded with uh, communists in the government. Uh, Harry Hopkins ran much of the government. If you read Major uh-huh. Jordan's diaries, and I urge all of you to look that up, you can find them online. It's actually Major George Racy Jordan, is his name, uh, his testimony before Congress, in which he describes his job during World War II uh, as security, base security at an air base, I think it was Montana or Wyoming, where American transports were being flown in every day from all over the U.S., and then they took off and went to Alaska and then into Russia. And what were they carrying? Always sealed boxes and sealed valises. They were actually sealed. Anyway, one day, George Racy Jordan, Major Jordan, took two or three armed guards with him and went into one of these American transports. I'm not sure if it was a DC-3 or DC-4 at the time. But he went inside, and in the back of the plane, American air crews flew them, by the way, but in the back of the plane were all these sealed valises, boxes, crates, containers, Sealed shut, not to be opened. And there were two Russian-Soviet guards back there on the back of the plane. And he went in the doorway, and they lowered their guns on the Russians, and they said, get out of the way. And they started to actually sob, please don't open these, 
please don't open these in their broken English. And he went over and opened them, a whole bunch of them, and looked in them. And they were full of all of our absolute top secret material about our nuclear weapons program, about our strategic defense alliance, about our strategic minerals, oil, uh, precious uh, metals, you name it, stocks, bonds, cash. We also flew over during those flights, which went on throughout the war, actually enriched uranium and pieces and parts and parcels of a nuclear weapons program that we gave to the Soviets. This is a fact. Major Jordan's diaries. Read it. You know, there is so much. I think the majority of history is not written. Yeah? No. No. When we focus on these, uh, you know, Marines and Army guys who are sent to their deaths horribly in places like Guadalcanal, the slaughter of, you know, all these farm boys from both sides. And uh, all unnecessary. The didn't have to. None levels of, was never didn't have looked to. at seriously. <laughs> no, none Except, of that. You know, in some sort of through some heroic lens of propaganda, you know? a perverted so, heroic horrible. lens of propaganda. So, so you know, Earhart was definitely used as a pawn. And I think the thing is, how come there wasn't, you know, an aircraft carrier, or a submarine, or even a merchant vessel? In the vicinity, in case you know she fell out of the sky, in case her plane crashed or she was shot down or something, to try to rescue her. Should have had picket and ships she could all have along. Been rescued from Millie Island. There was hardly yes. any guards there. The yeah. place where she was, she was forced to land by these two mail carrier planes. The Japanese, the place was lightly defended. You know, all they had for ground planes that land because their airfields were still under construction were, were you know, uh, fighter Flo- planes. They were trainer planes, trainer planes, yeah. by, you know, uh, that could be used as fighters, biplanes from a different year, earlier era that could, you know, mounted with a small machine, maybe a 30 caliber machine gun. And then, um, you know, so it, it didn't take much to stop her. She was unarmed. You know, she, she had no protection. And uh, she could have outflown one plane, but the Japanese were smart enough to send them. Of course, a, a you know a main plane and a wingman, right? They right. would uh, do it that way, so that way they could outmaneuver her. Yeah, so and so she, it's really tragic she was caught at all. Yeah? She was yes, she was left along with Fred Noonan, I guess, mm-hmm. for the better part of the three and a half years between July second, nineteen thirty-eight. And, or 1937, and, yeah, and uh, Pearl Harbor. She was yeah. kept, was, are we to think that they were kept prisoner for three, three and a half years, abandoned by yeah, Roosevelt? Yeah, yeah, they weren't executed after the war was started. The Japanese, the Japanese you know, thought that if, the, if this situation blew over U.S., Japan, and all, uh, they would able probably be able to return her to the state with a cover story. You understand? It could be worked out. Oh, it could have been worked out uh, immediately. But when the, war came, yeah. when the war came, they had to execute Noonan, and they're going to kill him. They might, they had to kill his pilot, too. So, you know, it was... So she was left there to rot by uh, Roosevelt and Eleanor Roosevelt, the great humanitarian Eleanor Roosevelt. I think people got to wake up to you know, uh, big power politics, the cynicism of these politicians, which continues today, you know? Which oh, continues today. Who, well, I, I know we're, you know, haven't been covering Fukushima uh, at all, but uh, yesterday the new chairman of Tokyo Electric Power said very forcefully, well, he's got to dump millions of tons of water containing tritium into the Pacific Ocean. That has to be done. TEPCO has to start making money. they got to restart their nuclear plants. And he didn't come out with that because Donald Trump took the money. Took the money from Shinzo Abe, took the money from mm-hmm. Masayoki son of SoftBank, right? Yeah. Let them all, uh, you know, uh, uh, went to Saudi Arabia, which was arranged by SoftBank to take billions from the Saudi king in person at a grand ceremony. Yep. There's a price to pay. There's a price to be paid. And the price Tokyo is saying, we're going to dump all the water now, you guys. Yeah. You took the money. Now, sh- you know, now just shut the F up and go home and watch TV. This huh? is the, I this mean, is yeah. the water in the tanks, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, yeah. hundreds, millions, hundreds, millions of tons. Yeah. yeah millions yeah. of tons. Uh, hundreds of tons. Water is going to be dumped in the Pacific. And I'm, I'm probably pretty sure, you know, as soon as he made the announcement, they opened the taps. So well, they, the rainy season. I would think, I would think you're right. Push out the water. Don't Pardon? forget also that the normal, amount of water that passes under the plant and goes into the ocean completely yeah, contaminated 
is uh, That's four to five hundred tons. Admittedly, it could be a thousand yeah. tons yeah. a day. Nobody it's, it's knows. Much more than that. It's, yeah, we're we're talking about you know thousands and thousands and thousands. Yeah, you know, ton of water is not much. One cubic meter of water. That's nothing. You know, so, yeah, it's coming out of there. But the price to be paid. You know, when you take that kind of money, starting with Michael Flynn took the money. And Trump and, and the rest of the team, they all took the money from right. Japan. And we know Japan and these governments broke. So the assumption is this is an investment. This is a tremendously good investment in the Trump administration. And frankly, you know, he's been really disappointed on nuclear. So I make the comparison with Franklin D. Roosevelt to his supporters. Wake up. Look at all these liberals and leftists who were in awe of Roosevelt and turned a blind eye to his you know, towering crimes, you know, provoking World War II, you know, um, ha- had he gone in there and said, what happened to Amelia Earhart? I demand a response. Otherwise, American bombers will be flying over Tokyo. The Jap- you know, maybe World War II never would have happened. Think about that. You know, you're you 100% know, percent correct. If he acted you're, like I, a man right. instead of like yeah. a worm, you know, you yeah. know, as part of the slime, you know, the, we call it the swamp, uh, the swamp creature, there may, you know, the Pacific War may not have happened. It was, I mean, what happened to Earhart was a massive test of national character. She showed spunk. You know, she didn't have to do that last mile, as I pointed out. But she right. knew Millie Island was the westernmost island. That's the one that's going to have telltale signs. If the Japanese really intend to invade the United States from there, there's going to be an airstrip at Millie. And by God, she was right. She was forced to land on that airstrip. Look at the top of rents, read the article by Yoshi, and look at the, the photo presentation. Understand that, uh, and I've got a picture of uh, uh, the atoll today. It's, it's, it's quite clear. Uh, you can see the dock. It may not be the exact same dock, but uh, it's, it's there in the picture. And that's where they were sitting when that photo was taken. It, it's right there. You'll just you pull up the story, uh, open it up, scroll down, and the first thing you see is a, a contemporary photograph of the actual location where the most famous picture of all was was uh, was taken. It's it's right there, and I don't yeah, I don't well, know how you can look at that. Self-help. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, yeah, yeah. I said you don't look at the photo. Read the photo. Look at the information it bears. It's actually an intelligence telegram. You know, the genius of the best code is that it's not hidden. You know, it's hidden in plain sight. It's That's right how in they front do of your it. eyes. Yeah. What it's supposed to convey, but 90.99.99 you know, uh, people will not even notice that there is a message in there. And yeah, the plane is in there, the uh, float plane with which they took to. Uh, Flagellane Island, you know, is there. And so, uh, is that's there. the one on the right. Union is there. The translator is there. It's all there. there it's basically a report. You know, Noonan. Yeah. And Noonan was the main suspect. You're the one they, uh, the, the Japanese knew about him. He you was know, the intel. Had, uh, he was the intel asset that was running the spy yeah, the, the Jap- And he was on the, he was a, a, not just a navigator, but the chief navigational instructor for Pan American Airlines, Those Pan big Am. Clippers and that at they the flew. time they had a yeah. China clipper service. I mean, mm-hmm. Japanese diplomats were flying on those planes. I mean, so Noonan, who was in charge of all the charts, all the information, working internationally, you know, talking on the radio. I mean, they knew his voice. He was a known figure to the Japanese, you know, operating in Shanghai, you know, and Shanghai was a Japanese intelligence. He was not just some uh, hack navigator that was picked up and and put in the cockpit with her. He was a high-level operative, no question. Yeah, he was put in the last month, in the very last month before the flight, and he bumped their other co-pilot. He was bumped. And he was supposed to get off at Howland Island, their destination, after mm-hmm. flying over the Japanese-controlled marshals. He was supposed to get off and board a, uh, a, a second Navy cutter, and that would have had. He would have taken with him all of the radio intercepts, all of the uh, photographs, and all of the most important sketches, the navigational sketches, because he would have uh, taken data. Right. Uh, on those airfields, you know, like uh, with his compass and all that, which uh, would have determined everything. 
you know, was, uh, you know, NATO, the, to the Office of Naval Intelligence. And that, uh, that Cutter would have then forward all that information by radio up to Pearl Harbor, you know, so... Um, when you look at the you know, picture of, uh, of Jaluit, uh, the atoll, at the top of the photo yeah. page, and you see that dock there, yeah. it's, that's history right there. And that's, that's what you're looking at in that picture from the History Channel. Yeah. And I do yeah. want to echo what Yoshi says about uh, we should commend the History Channel for doing something that took a great deal of courage. And it obviously from the person who hosted the program, former executive assistant at the FBI or something like that, uh, this had to get some green lights from, there may be a conflict, I don't know, but somebody green-lighted this thing, or it wouldn't have been done. Yeah. It was interesting to see. Well, it's been a long time, you know, that 70 years. 80 years. You know, hold, uh, you know, yeah, it's been 80 years. The 70 year hold on, uh, on classified documents expired 10 years ago, so, you know, it's high time this came out, so. Right. And that's exactly what the History Channel should be doing. You know, they do some remarkable work sometimes compared to something like Nat Geo and you know, those other, you know, you know, you know, perpetrators of propaganda. Right. You know, so I, I give them uh, full credit for that. I, you know, and then what you have added with your photo analysis has been just excellent. I was astonished because I noticed things in the photo, but I don't have, you know, I don't, I don't use Photoshop. <laughs> I don't have the tools. Okay, no, I don't either. To really mm. get into those things in micro, you know, precision detail that you and uh, Jeff, uh, what's his name? Uh, Neff James. Over there. Yeah. Was James, yeah, Neff over there. We're able to do, you know, the two of you really, uh, you know, put a, uh, what do you call it? Like a, a Sherlock Holmes magnifying glass on those photos. I was astonished at that little icon that uh, Fred Noonan was holding. It's called a Kirin. Now, people have here heard of Kirin beer, you know, the Japanese beer. Yeah. So just buy a can there, go to the store and look at the Kirin on the label. That's what's on uh, a smaller, like a childlike version of it, is on that banner. Uh, that was used the little, the little sign he's it's holding a, up is a Kirin yeah. symbol. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, and just like the Kirin beer from Manchuria. So the image was given to him by one of the, there's thousands of Korean slave laborers sent to the marshals to build this. It was given by him, probably by a Korean prisoner, as sort of as a good luck charm, because the Kirin represents an animal, it's a magical creature, uh, basically a stag, okay, a deer, but uh -huh. it walks on the clouds, okay? It walks on the clouds. So obviously Noonan and... Uh, your heart were pilots. They were cloud walkers. Okay? There you go. But also yeah. it was meant to give them sort of an immortality. It was a wish that they would not be harmed by the Japanese. And you see how friendly that translator is next to him. These are people part of the Christian resistance against Japan. You know, the Japanese were always paranoid that the Christians among the Marshallese would report back to the Australians. There were a lot of Australian missionaries there. Oh, and they of were course. paranoid about yeah. these spy networks. And that's why they did that photo and they backdated it. Okay, in the National Diet Library, that's that photo was backdated to nineteen thirty five. So they had to they realized they had to maintain this deception around around the potential spy networks among the Marshallese Islanders. And as you know, since the end of World War II, as part of the Marshalls became independent, I believe the other part was a U.S. trusteeship, you know, the hostility toward the Japanese, you know, there's a friendship with the Japanese on one hand, but there's also hostility against the atrocities, the spy networks, the brutality toward prisoners and all that, right. you know, so, so the Japanese had a lot to fear. They were outnumbered, you know, by Koreans and Marshallese, and also there were many Japanese dissidents on this who were prisoners and were sent there to work. So the things weren't under full control. And therefore, given that situation, Roosevelt had many, many, many opportunities to mount a rescue operation. You know, many. To break out your heart and Noonan. Absolutely. It was inexcusable that something like that wasn't. Mm -hmm. didn't have to be done by Americans. It could have been done by a third party. He could have done it, and he didn't do it. He wanted her to be done away with. And, you know, he is part... Of uh, he takes he takes probably I would say major responsibility for her death. The Japanese really didn't know what quantity she was, or even Noonan. They they just couldn't figure it out, you know. Uh, except the fact that they were building these secret bases there, mm -hmm. and uh, but the people on the ground didn't realize Roosevelt suspected Japan was going to invade uh, Latin America and the United, continental United States from the Pacific, South Pacific Islands. 
you know, the people on the ground there didn't have any idea. Their intelligence headquarters. In fact, these, this this book, this this photo was sent to pa, uh, to uh, Palau, which mm-hmm. is toward New Guinea, it's in uh, Melanesia, and this was the intelligence headquarters for spying on the Australians in New 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 Guinea, but more importantly on the Dutch in Indonesia, in Dutch East Indies, because the Japanese target was to grab the oil fields in Sumatra. You know, uh, the United States and the Netherlands were starting to graduate. And you got to remember, Roosevelt was Dutch, yeah? He's a Dutch, you know, Standard Oil, Royal Dutch Cell. They're like sister companies. Uh, So the Dutch were sort of ratcheting up pressure on Japan at the time. So the Japanese were preparing all these bases to uh, take the oil fields of Indonesia. Hmm. You know, you mentioned Palau. That's where uh, Truck Lagoon is, right? Yeah, and it's yeah, in, truck, it's yeah. it's in that uh, that chain of yeah. islands, and that yeah. was one of the enormous. Uh, they call that the something Turkey shoot. The Americans had the Japanese overwhelmed, and they they there yeah. were so many ships in that that harbor at Truck Lagoon. Yeah. They just sank them all. The heck out yeah, of the place. They, they just yeah, yeah, it was grim. Now, yeah, me... that, um, the movie Hacksaw Ridge. Everyone should see it. You, if you, to get an idea of what kind of war it was in the Pacific, it was incredible slaughter on both sides, and um, all of it preventable. All of it preventable. You know, the Earhart incident, I think, was crucial to either to the direction that World War II would take toward Pearl Harbor, uh-huh. and not. From uh, from Peru up to the United States, and even crucial for the war, because had Roosevelt mounted a rescue mission and rescued her and used that to confront Japan, I don't think Pearl Harbor would have happened. You know, the Japanese would have been buffaloed by that. They would have said, "We've been caught. They know everything, right?" Oh, I completely so, agree with you. You know, there's a lot of historians said Roosevelt knew exactly what the Japanese were up to. Open the gates, encourage them to come in, right? Sure. Absolutely. I mean, our historians, yeah. uh, you know, even people like John Dower. I mean, these are these are like massive mainstream American historians who said, you know, Roosevelt was largely responsible for not using his intelligence to stop the war, but rather wanted the Japanese to attack. But he wanted to choose the direction. He wanted the war to happen, but he was going to make sure he was going to win that war despite the huge sacrifices Mm -hmm. of life on both sides. You know, it's the most deadly war in American history. I think the, uh, well, actually, I think the Iraq war, when you add up the number of Iraq war veterans who have died since the war, is right up there near the top, too. Hold on just a minute. We'll be right back. Uh, Yoshi and I will continue. You're invited to the top of rents.com. Take a look. And here's a stat for you, Yoshi, as we go to the break. America has been at war 222 out of the 239 years it has been a country. 222 out of 239, America has been at war. That's a lot of war. Back in a minute. back with uh, Yoshi, and do read his uh, brilliant essay at the top. It wraps up the whole story. Uh, so they were held captive for apparently over three and a half years. Uh, we also have some reports that they were both beheaded, uh, not shot, and buried in shallow graves on Saipan. Others suggest that they were taken and, and their remains were seated on another island to throw searchers off. We don't know. We don't know what happened. What did you hear about that? What was the final disposition of their bodies? Do we know? If they were buried on Saipan... Well, I, th- I think they were uh, shot because, you know, that would be the normal way of killing a spy. I think uh-huh. Richard Sword was shot, you know, so that's just a standard procedure. So a lot of ammunition for uh-huh. the Japanese, but I think that's just their procedure. You know, beheading and all is an honorable death. Or it would be just for if they're totally out of ammunition, as they were in non, at Nanjing and non, in the Nanjing executions. There, you know, they killed uh-huh. eighty thousand Chinese uh, soldiers who had dropped their uniforms 
and were considered spies, and they killed them with swords. So uh, I think the seeding went on. Uh, the broken parts from the plane, some of them were dumped. But the plane itself is mainly intact. So uh, that is, I think, the bigger mystery is what did uh, what did FDR, what did Roosevelt do with the Lockheed Electra? He had it repaired. It was put back together. The parts were flown in. And so Lockheed would have an accounting of those spare parts, the Lockheed company. They were flown there, and they, uh, the plane went, and it had to be Lockheed service people, too, well, at least one engineer that went out there to put it back together and make it fly. But what did they do? That Earhart's plane is somewhere hidden by the U.S. government. I don't think they just crashed it. I think I think that is just oh, they would have kept plenty it. of war planes. There are plenty of planes that were shot right. down over the Pacific, you know, right. so... I, I think uh, he kept it as a memorabilia, sort of like a sick memorabilia uh, of some sort. Or maybe Lockheed has it to see, uh, to do their analysis. You know, the plane would have been very, very valuable to them uh, for technical reasons of mm-hmm. analyzing how Electra and their future design, you know, the design improvement of a very advanced model plane. How do we know, Yoshi, that the plane was, in fact, on Saipan at an airfield or or? Well, uh, I think facility. a lot of GI saw it. You know, in, in Tokyo, there was uh, uh, one U.S. Navy guy, not not a guy with a gun, you know, but an uh, engineer or something. He, they, he saw it. But there, it, was, it was well known. The Lockheed Electra there was mysterious to everybody because uh, they do knew and did know it was the same model as Earhart's. Other uh-huh. than that, they did that's, not know that's... it was Earhart's because she was supposed to have crashed somewhere else. So they were all wondering what this thing was, and it disappeared. Perhaps Lockheed Company sent a plane there. I don't know. Maybe it was, but it was apparently sitting on the airfield. They found it when the Japanese surrendered, and it remained there for months. You know, and so it was obviously Earhart's plane. It wasn't just flown in by Lockheed as part of an investigation. It was mm-hmm. sitting there too long. Okay, so you know there there's still a lot of mysteries that need to be uncovered in Lockheed Corporation you know uh, you know crooks that they are should do something about it. maybe it's for, especially former aviation engineers or mm-hmm. people who worked on repair crews mm-hmm. uh should come up with some divulge some information this this story is going to stay alive for a long while so, there are records yeah you know, there's there are no people alive down. now that know uh, look, the uh, granddaughter of the guy who took that photograph now, the famous photograph, uh, is the yeah. governor of the Marshall Islands. And this is like, the Northern Marshalls, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, the U.S. part, okay. Yeah. And, and she, she said her father was executed? Her grandfather. I think it was her grandfather. Her grandfather was executed. As yeah. a spy? Yeah. By the Japanese? Yeah. Yeah. So th- this is what I mean. They 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 cleaned out... They tried to wipe out anyone who directly knew about Earhart as American forces were advancing. They obviously murdered the Marshallese as many as they could. And so the testimonies we have are people like, you know, a girl on a bicycle who happens to go by. I think that uh, she spotted the Electra, I believe. Uh, no, she spotted Earhart, I think, exercising out in the in the prison yard, you know. Uh, so there are a lot of mar- incidental Marshallese accounts, okay? There were just too many people who were witness to their capture. But the main participant, the man in the know, the photographer, and it's not clear whether he was Japanese or Marshallese, because there was a lot of intermarriages on those islands. Uh-huh. So my suspicion from the photo was that he was Japanese, okay, because it's a very kind of Japanese type composition that he took. It's very uh-huh. and there was a lot of work probably inside the dark room too. So I suspect she's partially Japanese by uh, you know, patrimony or whatever. So right. and there's, again, more and more, there's plenty of mysteries left, you know, and this whole group that's been searching for the plane, I think, I think they've been off the wall. They were, they're looking at all this little technical information instead right. of doing the oral histories. And then say, I mean, you have to take a much broader approach as we tried to do here. You know, yes, we exactly. try to look at all factors. That's right. All factors. And all the, all, also the operational procedures of Japanese, naval intelligence, or Japanese intelligence at the time, and American naval intelligence. It was an intelligence war at that time that was going on. It was not a declared war, but an intelligence war. And both sides fought it pretty uh, methodically and ruthlessly. The records. Japanese were only surprised. What the Japanese kept, I think, digging at with Noonan is they could not believe how would you send a, a new 
at Lockheed Electra, one of the most advanced aircraft in the world just out, over this remote part of the Pacific and not have a backup team, not have a full rescue operation. Yeah, this is what the Japanese were just sort of, you know, uh, pounding Newton about. Who is working with you? Who are your guys in the late New Guinea? New Guinea was especially important because they were planning to assault the Indonesia, uh, Indonesia, right? Uh-huh. And, and New Guinea yeah. is part of the flanking action. Half the island belonged to the Dutch. So, uh, so this is, and Newton had no idea what the hell they were driving at. You, you see what I'm pointing? You see I do. Point? I do. This is very interesting. No one would ever mm-hmm. suspect that the great Roosevelt, you know, who a self-proclaimed genius, former assistant secretary of the Navy in World War One, mm-hmm. would plan such a shoddy amateurish operation. It would be inconceivable to any other intelligence agency of any great power in the planet, except wow. maybe the British. You know, the British have a long experience with Americans and know how the Americans can you know, mess up. So. He sure exposed his cowardice, and that's the word you used, and it is absolutely spot yeah, on. He, he yeah, he backed out. He backed out. People yeah, know about this. Uh, this uh, they're, they're, Yoshi, there are files somewhere uh, about it. We know exactly what happened. Somebody somewhere yeah. knows. We had spies. They had of spies. It's, it's, it's not a mystery. If you're on the inside yeah. someday... It's this Office will... of Naval Intelligence would happen. Oh, and I, I know, of office, course. There was no CIA then. It's Office of Naval Intelligence that would have that information. I hope some Navy intelligence officers come forward with this stuff. It's a patriotic duty to come if, forward. If you know? anyone wants to contact uh, Yoshi or myself about this, yeah. and I know in this day and age there's really no, no anonymity, but uh, if you want to mail a letter, whatever, yeah, we'd like to know. We'd like to know, and we'll protect you. Uh, you're a source, so don't worry about it. But don't take this yeah, stuff to the grave points. with you. Go ahead. A couple of other points, Jeff, here is how the Japanese government, you know, their propaganda, their foreign ministry, is able to manipulate the American press. You know, they wine and dine the uh, Tokyo Bureau's chiefs of the New York Times, Washington uh, Post, give them all kinds of perks, free trips, you know, factory visits, all kinds of stuff, you know, year-end gifts, you know, the New Year's gifts, you know, uh, the New York Times publishers, the Schultzbergers, come over, and all the Japanese corporations line up in the Japanese government institutes to give money to the New York Times for ads, so supposedly for ads and things like that, you know, buried in some back page, but, you know, and just a, you know, a nominal something will be run to justify collecting all that lucre from the Japanese... You know, the, this has been going on. It continues to go on. It's despicable of the American free press to allow themselves to be bought. It was despicable of uh, General Michael Flynn, like all the other generals posted in Japan, filling their pockets with yen, ill-gotten yen, okay, going over to Tokyo and being wined and dined, giving girls or boys whatever they want. It is disgusting, okay? And this is what led to World War II, this, you know, the sinfulness of the American side be willing to be bribed in Tokyo, and so to a point where Tokyo says we got the Americans in control. We're walking all over them. Now let's so go the take de- America. The debauchery yeah. was so glaring yeah. in the thirties, yeah. and the Japanese yeah. they just they just feasted on it. They just used it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There were plenty of uh, in the Japanese uh, communities. These little restaurants where all the mayors and you know defense officials would uh-huh. go there eat Japanese food in the old back room with one of the girls, okay? You know, all gratis, you know, all for free, right. all right. run by the Japanese intelligence service. There was a whole network, okay? And, you know, as Japanese-American, there's a lot of other Japanese-Americans who just cringe at this stuff. They say, oh, uh, we were, you know, we never betrayed America. Yeah, well, there were girls in the back room who were born in America. Where, you know, so I'm just saying, is, let's be realists here, folks. I, I don't support the relocation, the internment. But on the other hand, there were legitimate fears that, you know, of all this hanky-panky going on, okay? That American mm-hmm. official dump and the FBI did what it could at limited resource. They knew some things were going down in Latin America, especially in Peru and Brazil, mm-hmm. you know, of uh, preparing to invade, you know, the United States. Mm-hmm. This is no joke. So Roosevelt was paranoid. He, he, you know, and but he made that classic mistake of intelligence, wanting to see his curiosity get got the hold of him, right? To see what's the next thing they're going to do, where is it leading to? And by the time the bus, the arrest came down, it was too late. The war had already begun, right? Right, right. Exactly. Had he arrested these people, 
before the war, the Japanese would have been deterred. But he let it go on so long until after Pearl Harbor. So this was a classic. You know, Roosevelt comes up as uh, one of the smartest president of American history. I think he, he really goofed it up. You know, he's resp- one of the ones responsible for the war, for leading the Japanese on and the thinking this was going to be a pushover. America is, and that was the attitude in Japan. The America won't last 30 days, you know. They, they, they talk That's big, very interesting. Okay in very interesting. Yeah. No respect. It's well known. None. It's talked about by huh. even American occupation guys I met when, when I was younger. That that was the Japanese attitude, you know, at the time. You know, t- tremendous overconfidence that America would cave in. Japan could occupy America for a while, and then you will get a quizzling group in finally, uh-huh. and America will be very much what it is today: a partner of TEPCO and a partner of Toyota. Okay. So the Japanese have won. You know, the Japanese fundamental attitude was right. It was just their tactics. They didn't have to use guns. They just used money. And America fell. And just like Trump fell, right? Trump fell. Sure did. Like a like an overripe peach. It went flat on the splat. ground, right? That's he, the word. Yeah, he, he's in the pocket. Flynn, Flynn was the bag man. Yeah. Trump is completely in the pocket of the Japanese and the Israelis and whoever uh, else. Uh, Abe must laugh. They must laugh. Yeah, well, that's why Abe, you know, when you ran that title on uh, Amelia Earhart, he unleashed his dogs on you, you know, the dogs of denial. Remember, you ran that Abe should apologize. Yep. I mean, that got to the foreign ministry right away, and they unleashed these, uh, you know, these someone at Newsweek, one of the minders at Newsweek, Japanese minders, and the Japanese military buff, Otaku, a buff. Who uh, came up with these outrageous, uh, you know, little bits of disinformation? Oh, oh please! The, uh, Koshu yeah. boat was far away. We knew it was far away. It took six months to get them off that little island and over, you know, or at least let's say five months to get them off that little island. Right. No, they want to. Uh, Japanese authorities want well, to like stay there where you are in case we need to call in the Americans to get you out of there, right? So. So the Japanese disinfo service is alive and well, just like it was back then in the 1930s, 80 years ago. The same games are going on. The Americans are still the same suckers. I I agree. Uh, when you look at the pictures, by the way, uh, in the picture story, understand that uh, Amelia is sitting on the dock and she's looking out at her plane on the bow of that that ship, and mm-hmm. it's a it's a small freighter. We used to call them tramp steamers. There's another one. Yeah, they're a tramp steam. steamer. It's the, a tramp steamer is what the, it is. The, yeah, the, it's a tramp the, steamer. But the Koshu Maru is the other one pulling the float plane yeah. on the barge. Yeah. When you right. look at the at the, uh, the Lockheed Electra on the front of the other boat, which is unidentified so far, although I think the History Channel, once they see what we've done, will be able to identify well, that World War One. I. I think it was a German I think it's a German freighter from uh, it actually before looks, the war. It looks Germanish to me, uh, but yeah, yeah. I think it was uh, one of the ones captured when you know that that whole area, much of the Pacific there was all a German colony. Yeah, you know? that's right. And so the Japanese took it. Japanese were in the Anglo-Japanese alliance and yeah. allied with the London Naval Treaty with the U.S. Yeah. So they joined the uh, uh, Western side, you know, the Allied side of that war. So that, to me, looks very, very much like a German vessel, an old steamship right. vessel, you know? The you other know, ship... Which, and the Germans ran a lot of tramp steamers like that, you know? They just... Because, they, you know, the engines would go on. You know, the Germans built the engines to go on forever, you know? <laughs> yeah. You know, until the ship was finally holed yeah. or something, ran on a reef. These yeah. things would last forever, you know? Yeah, yeah, the... Uh, other ship, if you notice, both of them have uh, booms or cranes. Or the booms is what yeah. they are for lifting yeah. Yeah, uh, heavy they're things for salvage operations. Yeah, the yeah. other ship would have. Uh, you know, used... these float planes. They had to often transfer. You know, uh, what do you call float planes, flying boats. What do you call uh-huh. those things? Seaplanes. Uh, seaplanes. Now they seaplanes. Yeah, you had to transfer them. So the, uh, they're 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 perfect for moving aircraft around. And there were some pretty big. Uh, seaplanes in those days. That was a glorious era of seaplane technology. Oh, those Pan Am Clippers. The Japanese were... had all kinds of wonderful ones. Pardon? Yeah, the Pan Am Clipper for us. And the French, too, over in Tahiti and all. They used yeah. a lot of wonderful seaplanes. As you, know, you joked in that, you joked with me once online about the planes, you playing know, Fantasy <laughs> Island, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, so the other ship... That was a wonderful era of technology. If you look at the other ship, they probably worked together. 
The other ship used yeah. its uh, its booms in the back to hoist the Lockheed up on the bow yeah. of the other yeah. one. Exactly. Uh, and they tied right. it down. It's sitting up there right in the front, and she's looking yeah. at that. And can you imagine how she must have felt? Oh, my God. She was on the last leg of that journey. The rest have been right up and there's to her plane Hawaii up there and then boat. across. And she's done that in Hawaii, you know, right up to Hawaii. You know, that would have been it, right? Yep. That would have been it. Yeah, and then land in the United States. She could have run for president. Welcome. Yeah, she would have been the first American president. She was, you know, she was adored, you know, and yeah. adored. And, and I'm very happy to have gone to her alma mater to Purdue University, which a lot of people put down the Boilermakers and all in the middle of nowhere, but you know that it has the most illustrious graduate in the world, which is the Well, that's Art. really yeah. nice that you're proud of that. I, I, I've, yeah, I well, feel you know, it's a hell of a, otherwise it's a hell of a out there, yeah. practically dry, yeah. dry county, you know, you know, uh, Indiana, uh, you know, and I hope Mike Pence, you know, does something. While he's vice president, and if he becomes president, to honor Amelia Earhart and to get behind this history channel. The program biggest honor they could extend to her investigation is uh, to the biggest honor they could extend Yoshi is to uh, yeah. open their files. Here's yeah. what here's I what really we know. I really encourage happened. Vice President Pence, being a Hoosier, you know, a Hoosier uh, 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 from the, you know uh, a resident state of Indiana. You know, uh, Indianapolis is very close to Purdue, you know, and uh, I think Purdue's actually got campuses down there in Indianapolis. To take this upon himself personally, uh, Mike Benson is his wife, to vindicate Amelia Earhart. I, I hope this happens. It should happen so that the centennial of her downing will be, a you know, a tremendous uh, national event. A it should be holiday. a national holiday. Absolutely. Yeah, it should be a this, national holiday on that yes. centennial. She should be honored like no other American has ever been honored in the past, and especially a woman, you know, not a Hillary Clinton, but a great woman. Well, not I think you're right. But a great woman. Without you know? question. It's inarguable. The, the, woman the was, other uh, point I raised in my article at the end, I left it toward the end for those that this whole idea of the South Pacific, the German era there, yeah. the Japanese takeover is massively significant because in 1908, the uh, German artillery inst- art- artillery instructor in Tokyo, Karl Haushofer, he predicted that the Japanese would try to take the German colonies in the Pacific and Asia, okay? And he based a thing called geos... Uh, and this is for population reasons. He said the Japanese population is booming. They have to find Lebensraum, you know, room yeah. to live for their their growing population. Yep. He's the creator of Lebensraum theory. He was Hitler's top advisor for the Anschluss, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also, he was an esoteric Buddhist. Every fan of the occult should know the name Karl Haushofer. He belonged to an esoteric Buddhist group in uh, in, in Japan, you know, connected to an original temple in, in China, which is long ago been down, very close to Tibetan Buddhism. You know, it's in the, there's only two, well, there's actually uh, three esoteric schools. There's the Tibetan schools, uh-huh. there's the Shingon, which he belonged to, a branch of, and then you have um, Shaolin, you know, the, the Kung Fu school. Those are the three esoteric schools of Buddhism. So... This is like an incredible moment in history when the Japanese took over those islands. It's not very well understood. I don't think most of men, 99.9% of Americans, never even heard of this stuff. They have no idea how the Japanese got down there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and, and then this is, of course, linked to the assault on Pearl Harbor and the struggle, you know, for uh, the London, within the Washington Naval Treaty, Japan wanted parity. Right. And uh, that was the reason the Navy had such a grudge. It was the reason Hitler sent uh, uh, his German officers to uh, Nanjing and were participants in the Battle of Nanjing, the so-called Rape of Nanjing. It was that, that occurred on the German side. You know, mm. that massive historical events all hinged upon uh, Karl Haushofer, who's virtually an unknown character, except the people in circles that study a, a modern occultism. Other than that, he's, he's virtually unknown. And this is this massively shaped history. And that part of the world, you just think of Fantasy Island, you know, beach resorts, Tahiti, yeah. you know, Club Med, things like that. It has all these stereotypical images, you know. 
you don't realize how important it has been in shaping right. modern history of the 20th century and, and right. of our century today as a result. It is said that uh, the murdered Secretary of Defense, our first Secretary of Defense, James Forrestal, who was murdered. And yeah. If you don't know the story, look, just do a search, James Forrestal, was said to be a part of FDR's cover-up of Amelia Earhart and Fred Noonan. That was in a book that uh, came out several years wow. ago. Wow. I'll send you the link to that. Yeah, I didn't realize that would make sense. This. It would be part of a whole sure. naval intelligence operation in the Pacific, and Forrestal may have been a, may have been a critic in, of Roosevelt in his times, like I am now. Okay. Why didn't Roosevelt take any kind of action to stop the Japanese advance? You know, to to confront Japan and and show them the intelligence and say you're not going to do this. So, and then I remember they claimed Forrestal. Uh, had gone insane or something like that, right? Which he was not at all insane, right? They they put him under right. drugs. They did they did all good. Put him in a straitjacket. Yep. Probably Here. maybe electro. You know what do you call well, it? Electrodes on his uh, forehead and all that. You know electroshock. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, this is this would be a, uh, if that was the case that the Earhart case was one of the triggers for uh, Roosevelt to take out Forrestal. Then we have to completely revise the reputation of, uh, of, uh, of Roosevelt, not as a man who won World War II, but the man who created World War II, okay? Who brought America into the war, the Pacific War, and then the larger war, as one of the greatest war criminals in human history. If that's the case. And, and again, I hope the History Channel, uh, historians, I hope people in the U.S. government, the FBI, don't flinch at that thought that one of the American presidents may have acted in such a conniving way, whether by hook or by crook, that he brought upon this disaster. Sure, America took over the world, but what kind of world did America take over? Yeah. And what has America <laughs> become since World War II? You know, one of them, not the great democracy, you know, not the great anti-interventionist, not the America of the Monroe Doctrine, not the America of Washington, but just another imperialist power that America has opposed since its birth in 1776. Indeed. So Indeed. it would be, it would just be incredible if this whole reversal of Roosevelt as the greatest modern president were to actually prove true that he wasn't. He was the most greatest villain in American history. That would be astonishing. I'm not saying it now because. Unless we have all the historical facts, but the Forrestal murder, or, you know, if that if that is if that is the case, boy, are we onto something huge here yeah. for yeah. the history of America and for its future and how we judge our president. I think the most important thing is how do we judge American presidents? Okay, and I'm, I'm yeah, and I've already said Trump has got. I really supported him. I thought he had hope as, a, as to bring America back to its roots. Right. Uh, before the FDR era, you know, of America, that was a better place, you know, a, a yeah. uh, heroic country. Yeah. I'm, you know, to say I'm not disappointed, and I hope he doesn't follow in the footsteps of FDR, okay? I uh, being just a demagogue, a better. liar, a backstabber. I hope he doesn't move in that direction. I hope he comes back and comes to his senses. I, I hope agree. Trump comes to a sense. I don't know what's the matter with him, but well, he has gone off something, the deep end. Something is sure. really wrong. Uh, last hour yeah. I pointed out that one of his major campaign pledges was that uh, any couple making $50,000 a year or less would be no longer required to pay any income tax. They would be taken off the tax rolls, 50000 a year or less. That never went yeah. anywhere. It was never mentioned again, but I got him on video. Yeah. I mean, I've got the text of it. Yeah. He made that promise. Yeah. So what happened? All the promises seem to have been scuttled. I mean, at uh, least he did them. hold to wiping out this climate change nonsense. I give yeah. him that much credit. That and yeah. the T TPP so I don't, and that. I don't have entire, I'm not entirely yet lost hope in the man, but I hope he comes back to the Donald Trump we saw in the campaign. Right. Not this monstrous, you know, uh, brain dead, whatever tyrant we've seen since. Is totally yeah. confused. Doesn't know what he's doing. He seems acts to be under some sort of mind control. Exactly. This, this is terrible. You got it. You just this said is it. Terrible. Yeah. 
And he's got, and I think the Roosevelt story has a lot of bearing as a warning, not only to Donald Trump, but to future presidents. We demand an American president that acts on American principle. Well, what we, we, Amelia we, Earhart sacrificed her life for. That's right. Go she she didn't thank have to you. fly over Amelia. She no. could have, you know, t- turned tail. She could have ducked down to the British Islands and ran, but she felt she had to get the final smoking gun evidence, okay? She was a patriot. And as a result, she She's suffered a real terribly. Yeah. Yeah, she suffered terribly, and she did the right thing to try to stop this war, to stop the Japanese aggression. She did the right thing, and that was also for the. It's not about nationalism, because that was the right thing for no. the Japanese people. That needs to, to be. That and, needs into to that be. suicidal war. Okay. Right. That needs to be brought out. She was a hero for the world, for both let's, let's America hope. and Japan, the Pacific Islands, for Europe, for the world, and she, her life was sacrificed, I say, not in vain, not in vain. We should honor her with f- further investigation. The best thing we can do to honor her, member, her memory is to keep digging for the truth and to vindicate her against the Roosevelt's. Very well said. Thank you, Yoshi. Thanks for writing that, and thanks for everything. Uh, I think we've covered a lot well, this hour. Well, thank you for Jeff. When the History Channel was being assaulted by this dastardly you know, uh, Shinzo Abe's dastardly attempt at denial. I'm really glad you you and your team stepped forward to do the photo analysis yeah. and show that this disputed photo, in fact, was undeniably of Earhart, Noonan, and the Electra. Right. I really, uh, and that bailed out the History Channel, too. And uh, I well, think this was a remarkable moment when Rents.com did what it's there to do, which is to defend the truth, whatever the personal price or the cost. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let's hope that the History Channel steps forward and carries this to a logical conclusion. There's much more ahead. Thank you, my friend. We'll talk soon. All right. Okay. Yoichi Shimatsu, and uh, do read his brilliant article at the top of uh, Rents.com, and we'll be right back, and we'll be right back, and we'll be right back. 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 And we'll be right back.